attention to the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel chapter 27. I'd like to read in your hearing the first four verses, and I'm going to read it tonight out of the message translation, which might read a little bit differently than yours, but at the end of the night, the truth is just the truth. 1 Samuel 27, beginning at verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. David thought to himself, sooner or later, Saul's going to get me. The best thing I can do is escape the Philistine country. Saul will count me a lost cause and quit hunting me down in every nook and cranny of Israel. I'll be out of his reach for good. So David left. He and his 600 men went to Achish, son of Maok, king of Gath. They moved in and settled down in Gath with Achish. Each man brought his household. David brought his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, widow of Nabal of Carmel. And when Saul was told that David had escaped to Gath, he called off the hunt. And all the people said, Amen. Before you sit down, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor, you need to know tonight you're sitting next to a winner. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. And we want to tag this text with a title tonight, Winning in the Wilderness. Winning in the Wilderness. You might remember that during Super Bowl 37, FedEx ran a commercial that spoofed the movie Cast Away in which Tom Hanks played a FedEx employee whose company plane went down in the Pacific, stranding him on a desert island for a number of years. Looking like the bedraggled Hanks from the movie, the FedEx employee in the commercial goes up to the door of a suburban home with his package in tow. After ringing the bell, a woman opens the door and he explains to her that he had survived for five years on a deserted island in the Pacific Ocean and during that entire time, he kept that package as a promise of his deliverance so that he could personally deliver it to his owner. She gives him a simple thank you, but now he is curious about what's in the package that he had been protecting for five years. So he raises the question, he says, if I may ask, what after all was in this package that I was holding on to on a deserted island for five years? She smiles and says, nothing much, just a solar powered satellite phone, a global positioning device, a compass, a water purifier, and some seeds. Some of y'all got it, some of y'all didn't. Because I contend that just like the contents in that protected package, the resources for our success and survival are available to us no matter where we may find ourselves, if only we would take advantage of them. And these resources are tapped through a real daily abiding relationship with God. And as we track the travels of David through the text we're teaching tonight, we discover that God provides even in the wilderness experiences of our lives. Come here for a minute, because David spent the entire decade of his 20s in the wilderness as a fugitive with a price hanging over his head, chosen by God at a young age and anointed to be king of Israel. He entered the court of Saul and was loved as a friend, musician, and colleague. He saved his nation from Philistine military assault and became a hero among his people. But then he was driven from those accomplishments, accolades, and awards into the wilderness where he was forced to survive the best way that he could. We don't have an exact chronology, but for roughly 10 birthdays, David had to live as a renegade in the wilderness. 
I should pause there long enough to remind somebody that being chosen doesn't exempt you from challenges and being anointed won't necessarily abbreviate your adversities. Although he was young, he quickly became a veteran of wilderness living. David had to navigate nights of anxiety and days of distress while he was young. And the same thing is true with so many of our young today who are forced to face and live in rough and tough spaces where they literally have to struggle to survive enrolled in schools that do not teach them, connected to churches that struggle to reach them, living in a culture that is adversarial to them, growing in homes that often don't support them, surrounded by violence that threatens them, and companies that won't employ them, and prisons that thrive on them. They are in the wilderness struggling to survive. David was forced into the wilderness and somebody on a pew near you knows what I'm talking about because you too have been forced into places and spaces where you'd rather not be. From a distance, all wildernesses look the same, dry, arid, unpeopled, harsh, and cruel. But when you are in the wilderness, you begin to realize that each one has its own distinct character. No two difficulties are the same. No season of suffering is quite like another. No test or temptation is an exact replica of another. Every wilderness has its own characteristics. And that's at least one reason why we must be patient with each other and compassionate towards each other because while I may not be in your wilderness, you are not in mine. And yet everybody will have a wilderness experience at some point in their lives. Bump your neighbor and say, I know that's right, amen. That's why you ought to speak to everybody you see. You ought to smile at every face. You ought to shake hands with everybody you pass because everybody you see has a battle to fight, a burden to bear, a cry and a hurt that they're trying to handle. I don't care how good we look. I don't care how wide we smile. I don't care how loud we shout. All of us have a struggle to face, a river to cross, a stress to endure, a mountain to move, a deficiency to overcome, a tragedy to transcend, a sorrow to surmount, a problem to solve, a door to open, and a question to answer. Everybody has got to cry sometimes. I don't care whether you catch your tears on a silk Armani handkerchief or with a disposable paper Kleenex. Everybody's got to cry sometimes. Everybody has got to walk the floor sometimes. I don't care whether you're walking on plush carpet with three inch deep padding or whether you're on a bare floor with your bare feet. Everybody's got to walk the floor at midnight sometime and cry out, Father, I stretch my hand to thee. See, none of us are immune to irritation and none of us will be protected from pain, adversity, antagonists, accidents, and anger break in on us and we end up running for our lives into the wilderness. Has anybody here ever logged any time in the wilderness? Go on, bump your neighbor, say, stay out of my business tonight, amen. See, but David became a premier cartographer of the wilderness. He mapped the geography of the wilderness both internally and externally. That's what probably prompted him to pray. In Psalm 55, 6, he says, God, get me out of here on the wings of an eagle. I want some peace and quiet. I'm desperate for a change from all this stormy weather. Because wilderness is both a geographical reality and a spiritual metaphor. 
It was for Moses in the wilderness of Sinai. It was for Jesus in the wilderness of Judea. And it was for David in the wilderness that he inhabited almost 10 years. And sooner or later, it will be for you. But since it's inherent on our itinerary, I think that we ought to get a feel for it and even more so to become familiar with the way that God works to help us win even in the wilderness. Because we are not alone in the wilderness. God is there and God is at work. Somebody shout amen. See. And that's important because our first instinct is nearly always to try to escape the wilderness. But tonight, what I hope to do is convert our escapist impulse into a spiritually conditioned embrace. Because I believe as we steep our imagination in the story of scripture, we come to expect not only the undesirable worst, but also the unexpected best to show up and the wilderness experiences of our lives. God is at work in your wilderness. Would you give your neighbor that message? Say, neighbor, it may not seem like it, but God is at work. See, that's what David discovered, and that's what we've got to hold on to. Well, preacher, it's out in here. So what did God do to help David win in the wilderness? I'm glad you asked, because first of all, God assembled a group of people. Somebody holler, people. Listen to me close, that whenever you are called upon in life to go through the wilderness, God is so good. God is so gracious. God is so awesome and amazing that God will assemble a group of people around you whose assignment it is to go through it with you. That's a shout right there. You ought to smile at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you don't have to go through it all by yourself. See, alone and on the run from Saul, David made an abortive attempt to find refuge with Saul's enemy, King Achish. But he quickly discovered that having a common enemy did not automatically make Achish his friend. He narrowly escaped execution in Gath. In fact, the only way that his life was spared, the only way he got out of Gath was he had to pretend to be in insane. You know, it's one of the mysteries of God's grace that sometimes the way God gets you out of a bad spot is by putting you in a position where you got to act a little crazy. I dare you to tap your neighbor and say, don't push me because I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. <laughs> See, David, David, David got out of Gath by acting insane. And then he holed up in the cave of Adullam. But the text testifies he wasn't alone for long. On short order, we are not told how they are assembled around him. A group of 600 men. Now please grab that. As he worked his way through the wilderness, God gave him a completely improbable and unexpected blessing by forming a community around him. Somebody holler community. Now who were these people that gathered around him? Well the first to come were his siblings and this is surprising because the early glimpses that we are given of David's dealings with his siblings were as idiotic and antagonistic as President Trump's Twitter feed. When David was anointed king in chapter 16, it was only after all of his brothers had been rejected. And I don't care who you are, it's always a test of your maturity when somebody you saw as beneath you gets promoted before you. 
you would be amazed at how many people struggle trying to celebrate somebody else's success. Uh, a few years later, when David was commissioned by his father to take his brother's supplies on the battlefield, he was not greeted with welcome. They were in an embarrassing standoff with Goliath, and he was met with the ire of his oldest brother, who contemptuously accused him of neglecting his job. When his siblings showed up at Adullam, David wasn't likely to interpret their arrival as a display of affection, but they came because they were afraid that Saul's animosity would inevitably spill over onto David's kin. So even though they couldn't stand David, horseback walking or riding, his wilderness lair was the safest place they could imagine. Come here for a moment because deprivation, danger, distress, and dysfunction have a way of bridging the gaps between us that success satisfaction and status cannot these brothers became brothers under pressure in a way they had never been when they were at peace because trouble can push you past your pettiness trouble can move you beyond malice trouble can shake you loose from stupidity trouble can push you beyond spitefulness all of them were outcasts but this is the one place where the misfits fit perhaps Psalm 133 was a poetic remix of this time when David and his siblings found themselves on common ground maybe it was in the cave of Adula where he wrote how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity so the first to come were his siblings but they were followed by a group of people who might best be described as the struggling 1 Samuel 22 2 describes them them as being in debt, in distress, and discontent. This is a sociological profile of David's congregation, that everybody in it was in debt, in distress, and discontent. They were not the notable, they were the negligible. They were not the powerful, they were the penniless. They were not the sophisticated, they were the simple. They were the destitute, indigent rejects, dejects, and dropouts. These were the people that God sent to David in the wilderness. They foraged together and they fought together. They ate together. They acted together. They prayed together and they played together in hostile surroundings. It was prayer that reminded them that God was for them, with them, and working out his sovereign purpose in their lives. Prayer was critical to their survival. And in case you haven't figured it out, it's going to be critical to ours. Inexplicably, this motley collection of unloved people, the distress, the debtors, and the discontent, built a remarkable camaraderie. Now, please understand that the larger context in which this small story is placed, that of God working out his salvation in the world, not only permits but requires that we see this community as an embryonic form of the people of God. This text stretches our spiritual imagination to the horizons of God's sovereignty and challenges us to see that David's company made up of a people who were in debt, distressed, and discontent had indeed been brought together by the hand of God. In the wilderness, God assembled a people who would be defined not by what they had, not by where they came from, not by what they own, not by what they control, not by the clothes on their back, but simply by what God had done in their lives. Come here, God has a holy habit of taking people deemed as marginal and making them into something miraculous. God has has an infinite inclination of taking people who others see as inconsequential and making them into something spectacular. And there are some witnesses on your pew tonight because somebody in here can testify that God found you nowhere and took you somewhere. 
that God found you down and picked you up that God found you broken and has left you blessed and you've got to get that because all of us are who we are because of what God has done in our lives and this is critical because you're going to be constantly confused in Christian community if you don't remind yourself that none of us are here by our own merit. That all of us are here by the mercy of God and God is not through with any of us yet. Shake somebody's hand and say, I'm a work in progress, neighbor. Then shake somebody else's hand and say, I'm still under construction because God is perfect but God's people are in process that's tweetable right there and somebody here knows it's true because you came to church looking for God and to your dismay found yourself surrounded by gossip somebody here came seeking friendship and found only fake friends and artificial partners somebody came trying to grow in grace but with it under the weight of gripes and grumbles and Paul that tent maker from Tarsus he was realistic about this is when he said take a good look at who you were when you got called into this life not many of you were among the best and brightest not many of you were influential isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose people that the culture overlooks exploits and abuses that God chose the nobodies in order to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies Paul said that's why none of us ought to be blowing our own horn but if you want to blow a horn blow it for God see wilderness wilderness spirituality requires creating sacred space in your heart to live with other people who are still in process God assembled a ragtag group of people to help David work his way through the wilderness and God does the same thing with us that God sends to Bates and to every other church established in his name the anxious and the angry the bitter and the burden the callous and the compassionate the dynamic and the dysfunctional God sends the PhD the MD the JD the GD and they ain't got no D God sends those who think they are something and those who know they are not God sends the upper class the middle class the lower class the underclass and those who ain't got no class to remind us that God can use anybody at any time for any purpose because God has a plan. Go on, tap somebody and nod your head. Say, God's got a plan. See, see, God assembled a people because God had a plan. More surprising than the composition of David's swelling company of 600 men was the choice he made to accept employment with King Achish, especially since he was an undocumented, undocumented immigrant in the land of Gath. Now remember, the Philistines had been Israel's primary antagonist for more than 100 years. And David first gave notoriety as the man who had annihilated their champion Goliath. His fight song went number one platinum quicker than Jay-Z's fo 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 on the billboard charts in Israel when they played his hook that Saul has killed his thousands but David has killed his ten thousand. It was that song that incited Saul's anger and made him chase David in the first place. But now instead of standing up to them David was colluding with them. David's despair over Saul's murderous campaign drove him to make common cause with the classic enemies of the people of God. Listen to his self conversation. It's in verse 1. He says sooner or later Saul's going to get me. The best that I can do is to escape in the Philistine country. Notice where his trust is. Notice where his focus is. Notice where his confidence is. He's not concentrating on God. He's absorbed in himself. 
Can I share something with you? That's a definitive recipe for depression. When you start talking about the best I can do. He made the choice to join his enemies. Now scriptural commentators commonly do one of two things when they exegete this text. They moralize or they secularize. Can I break that down like a fraction? Because those who moralize criticize David. They believe he betrayed his calling and failed to trust in God. Those who secularize admire his savvy and his successful ascent that resulted in his rise and an increase in his family's fortunes but as I read this text in its context I see something else can I share it because David is more or less doing what he has to do in order to try to survive in disagreeable circumstances and there's not a person in here tonight over 25 who at least once in your life has not said I got to do what I gotta do go on look at your neighbor say ain't no need in line amen he's doing what he believes he gotta do in a disagreeable circumstance he lives not only on the money economy of the Philistines but he adopts the moral economy of the Philistines it's not the right thing to do but it's his choice but this is what I want you to see because it's precisely in these types of conditions that God works out his plan. Okay, you didn't get it, I'll say it different. That God works in circumstances that are less than ideal. Boy, if you got what I just said, your peace would return and you'll have joy the rest of your life. Because we keep waiting for things to get straight. We keep waiting for everybody to get unified. We keep waiting for everybody to agree with us and affirm us and confirm what we're thinking about. But this text contends it's in the middle of dysfunction. It's in the middle of disunity it's in the middle of this loyalty that God perfects his case and makes his plan okay I know it's hot I see I gotta help y'all let me see looking at you uh, how many of you just be honest tonight it's already hot as grease in a frying pan but 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 just look, by a show of hands, how many of y'all in here like chicken tonight? Y'all y'all eat chicken. Y'all, yeah, you'll be a suspect Baptist if you didn't eat chicken. Amen. Uh, uh, yeah, I could tell from looking at y'all that all y'all like chicken. You like all kinds of chicken. You like fried chicken. You like baked chicken. You like grilled chicken. You even like chicken and rice and chicken and dumplings. You like jerk chicken and barbecue chicken and rotisserie chicken uh, when you done with your rotisserie chicken I bet you take the scraps and make you some chicken salad but wait 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 you know what there's a problem and the problem is did you know that some people don't know how to eat chicken no 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 when you eat chicken you don't leave no meat on the bone. That's just disrespectful to the chicken who died that you might live. You don't waste a good chicken wing. You supposed to chew on the bone and suck on the bone. And if it's baked chicken, you dip it in the juice and let it swim around a little bit. You don't waste a perfectly good chicken wing and just as you don't waste chicken, I want you to know God will not waste anything that you have ever been through. That God works in circumstances that are less than ideal. God can get something out of everything. Every choice, every chance, every mistake, every misstep, every setback, every failure, every 
every long night, every dark day, every wrong turn. God can get something out of everything because God is always up to something in your life. Right now, he's making you. Right now, he's lifting you. Right now, he's blessing you. Right now, he's stretching you. Right now, he's promoting you. It's working for your good because he's intentional. Somebody shout hallelujah. See, watch this. Watch this. I'm in the text. Because it's God who protects David from violating his covenant. It's God who guards David's faithfulness to his anointing. It is God who works out his deliverance. The final verdict of our lives, pastor, is never in our hands. It's in the hands of God. That's why no weapon formed against you can prosper. That's why when your enemies and your foes come upon you to eat of your flesh, God sticks out his foot and they stumble and fall. That's why a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it won't touch you because God's got your back. See, and somebody here, somebody here knows what it is to have to live under the patronage of King Achish. But here's your word tonight. God's going to work out his plan for your life anyway. High five somebody, say anyway. God's plan will not be defeated. God's plan will not be dismantled. He's going to work it out anyway. So how did God help him win in the wilderness? He gathered around him a people so that God could work his plan and ensure his provision. Now this is a shout right here. It's just three words. God will provide. Would you give your neighbor that message? In case they can't hear me, say God will provide. Whatever is necessary for you to achieve your purpose, God will provide. Let, let me show it to you. Let me show it to you. David served Achish, and because his service was excellent, Achish gave him the entire town of Ziglag. Everybody say Ziglag. Ziglag became the center around which he and his people operated and the hub from which their provision was produced. And Ziglag in the text represents the church. A community of grace that God has given to you and me. Ziglag is a premier reminder of the mercy of God despite the malice of circumstances. Ziglag is filled with people who used to be toe up from the flow up but are now standing up, stepping up, speaking up and going up by the grace of God. And that's the story of the church because Christian experience is never just my story. It's our story. Look at your neighbor and say, all of us. See, we learn our story with others and we are to tell our story to others. We are not to be silent and sullen. We are not to hide our light or keep our stories to ourselves. But we are to tell somebody. And I mean your real story. I don't mean your Sunday morning story. I mean your real story. Because Psalm 107 verse 2 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Go and smile at somebody. Say, neighbor, you do not have the right to remain silent. Silent affirmation is not an option. Voiceless verification is not an alternative because we have a story to tell. Our story is not to be cryptic or hidden. It cannot be lived on the DL or kept under wraps, but we've got to tell it. It's a story of death, distress, and discontent, but we are charged to tell it. 
because in zigzag we bump into each other in zigzag we stumble over each other in zigzag we get mad at each other in zigzag we become distracted and disappointed we fall out and fall off and sometimes conclude that we gonna go off on our own and cultivate a pure spirituality uncontaminated by hypocrites only to discover that the road is just too rough and the going is just too tough and the enemies are just too mean for us to make it by ourselves because part of God's provision for us is us it's not just a place but it's a people it's us with our fears us with our doubts us with our issues us with our challenges us too arrogant to shout hallelujah us too cute to contribute too greedy to give too proper to praise too sophisticated to serve too high and mighty to give God the glory God's provision for us is us listen to me well tonight because there's somebody in this zigzag who needs what you have there's somebody here who needs your intelligence your skills and your smile they need your personality your sense of humor and your anointing somebody right here needs your charm and your song your testimony and your prayer your vision and your voice you are the missing piece to somebody's puzzle you are the missing character in somebody's story you are the missing element in somebody's equation you have what somebody else needs I dare you to grab your neighbor and say neighbor it's too hot for me to play with you but I'm going to need for you to get up off what you got because what you got may be what I need in order to get to my next level it's in zigzag that we get to see God work it's in zigzag that we get to see people walk by faith it's in zigzag that we get to see people shaped by the spirit we get to see people sacrifice in humility and engage in holy praise while they bow in fervent prayer it's in zigzag that we learn to lead like Harriet Tubman speak like Frederick Douglass think like Marcus Garvey save like Maggie Walker educate like W.E.B. Du Bois adjudicate like Thurgood Marshall challenge like Rosa Parks dream like Martin King fight like Malcolm X write like Maya Angelou act like Cecily Tyson sing like Aretha Franklin lead like Barack Obama preach like Bruce Williams and get up like Jesus it's in zigzag that we realize that part of God's provision for us is us that's why Jesus became one of us he was human in order to reach us but holy in order to rescue us human in order to come down where we are but holy in order to lift us where he is human in order to touch us but holy to transform us human in order to comfort us but holy in order order to change us Jesus it's the provision of God Jesus it's the righteousness of God Jesus is the mercy of God the favor of God and the grace of God Jesus is the source of our salvation the lifter of our heads the maker of our way and the keeper of our souls do you know know him have you ever tried him ain't he all right he's bread 
when you get hungry he's water when you get thirsty he's money in your pocket a roof over your head a doctor in your sick room a lawyer in your courtroom he's my rock my light my savior my sovereign my friend my provider my protection and he walks with me and he talks with me so be not dismayed whatever be tied God will won't he do it take care of you beneath his wings of love abide and God will take care of you God bless you pastor happy birthday we thank God for keeping you all these years because we know that you know it was nobody but the Lord and you ain't the only one in here tonight who got that testimony somebody on your pew if you had to testify you have to say it was nobody but the Lord come on shake off your heat shake off your sweat and high five somebody and say I got to tell it it was nobody but the Lord who fought my battles who dried my tears who calmed my fears somebody ought to throw your head back and say thank you it could have been me outdoors with no shoes no clothes all alone without a friend or just another number with a tragic end but he didn't see fit to let none of those things be every day every month every year he keeps on blessing me so I've got to say thank you thank you thank you thank you is he all right say yeah say yeah reach out and grab somebody's hand and hold it for a moment now better yet shake it for a moment now better yet shake them and rock them and rock them and shake them and say neighbor I am a winner even in the wilderness I can't give up now I've come too far I've cried too long I've struggled too hard I've fought too much for me to give up now is there anybody in here who's made up your mind that you gonna win say yeah 